Yeah. Off the start, we're, we're just um, halfway through item 10, in fact, or maybe not even halfway through. We've had the update from Craig McElroy and Andrew Chin from Healthy Waters and Water Care. Um, we, we now have another um, double presentation from Ross Roberts, Head of Engineering Resilience, and, and Paul Kleinack, General Manager of Resilient Land and, and Coast, to, to cover those particular parts of the, of the Auckland region and, and the flood event and the response and the cyclone. So, uh, Paul, are you going to lead off in this one? So, Ross, in fact, is. I think we've got everyone sitting down now. So, uh, welcome, Ross. Away you go. Uh, Kira, Kira Roberts, I hope. And what I'll do today is uh, briefly talk you through some of the landslide issues we've got around the region. And, and the, the focus will really be on showing you the various different impacts that have been experienced. Uh, my team's been in emergency response for the past two weeks. And so this is, this is really a first pass for you to give you an idea of the spread of the impacts and the different types of impacts that we've experienced. Um, so this is the, uh, our first example from the North Shore uh, near Narrow Neck. And what we've got here is a collapse of a cliff. And this is a, a useful example to share because it is private land. So this is a cliff that is privately owned. Uh, you can see um, the garden at the top with a, a fence hanging over. Uh, but what's most relevant here is that it has buried a stormwater outfall. So even where there is private land um, that has failed, it can affect council assets. And a lot of council assets have been affected in this way, and it causes us quite a lot of challenge um, with working out the, uh, the best way to remediate these. In this particular case, uh, we believe that our asset is probably still functioning satisfactorily, and so we're satisfied that nothing needs to be done urgently. Uh, moving over towards Birkenhead, Inkster Street, this is a, a classic example which represents many that we've seen where private land has been affected. Um, our team is working very closely with regulatory services, going around doing the placarding process, um, putting the red, yellow, or white placards on buildings to uh, say how they can safely be used. And that's a, a huge exercise which is continuing across Auckland and has uh, only grown uh, since the recent cyclone went through. Based on what we've seen so far, we believe there have been several thousand landslides in the Auckland region. And um, in the first event, um, in the order of about 300 uh, residential properties directly affected, it may be getting towards 1,000 now. Um, this is another example from the, uh, the Birkenhead area, just showing a, uh, a path, a council path, which has been um, completely destroyed and shows that there are lots of small assets like this which will be very, very challenging to reinstate, and the, uh, the costs associated when amalgamated across the region could be extremely extensive. Uh, I've thrown this one in. This is um, taken from a helicopter on the Saturday after the first rainstorm. And you can see that the um, landslides in the rural parts of Auckland are very extensive. And this is part of the reason why we have such high numbers. Um, but of course, where there are no direct impacts or relatively minimal direct impacts, it's of less importance to council. So when I talk about numbers being in the uh, the ten, you know, several thousands, um, we need to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt. What really matters to us is the ones that are impacting on the people of Auckland or the assets of Auckland Council. Uh, and to that, here's an example of uh, another one which is um, somewhere west of Walkworth that has taken out an entire slope. It's also uh, completely inundated a road and the main trunk line leading north from Auckland. Uh, so the railway is um, uh, completely destroyed, the road is completely inundated, and this is the sort of landslide that will take a very significant period of time to resolve, because that is uh, still on the move and will continue to be for some time. There's a lot of material in there to remove before those roads and that railway can be used again. Uh, moving down to our coastal cliffs again, uh, we have a lot of properties close to coastal cliffs. These are some examples from the Manukau Harbour, uh, and you can see how recent slips are uh, covering quite extensive parts of our um, cliff line. In most cases, they're very shallow, so the cliffs haven't retreated far, uh, but they have still retreated far enough to have quite an impact on many of the properties at the crest. Um, a bit like this one, where you can see that uh, what used to be quite a nice garden is now uh, severely. This is um, on the northern shore of the Manukau Harbour. Uh, 
so this has, of course, has uh, been assessed by the Rapid Building Assessment Process, uh, and the, uh, the damage is uh, going to be somewhat challenging to remediate for that one. It's not always by the coastline, though. So this is uh, just inshore um, near French Bay, and you can see there are quite a few landslides like this one uh, in that area where um, slips have come down on the steep slopes in that terrain, uh, damaged the properties at the top, damaged roads or properties at the bottom, and so there are lots of compounding, conflicting um, demands in those because there is a lot of landowners involved uh, and quite a lot of properties affected. Going back further north, this is near Puhoi, um, and this is looking at uh, the impact on council assets. This is uh, one that you might want to consider for um, the impact it has on the uh, linkages across the region. So you can see a few small landslides in this slide. Um, if you look at the nearest bend, there's a few. Uh, if you look in mid shots, there's a bigger slide that has cracked the road quite badly. But further back, you can see there are other cracks all the way around. And in reality, we expect that that whole slope is unstable. Uh, and that road is similar in some ways to SH25A in the Coromandel in that it will be a, a very significant effort to reinstate it. Um, before we go on to the um, coastal side of this, I'm going to uh, just skip over to something more recent, which wasn't able to be put into the uh, presentation directly because it's uh, new from yesterday. Uh, and that's some of our information from Murawai, where I've spent the, the last few days. So what you can see here is uh, drone footage taken yesterday of some of the locations there. Uh, you can see that we've got a very steep cliff at the back of the uh, site, which has failed in multiple locations and has caused serious damage to the houses at the tow. We've got a whole load of tow, uh, tow houses there um, running all the way along the cliff line, and there's been some very significant impacts on them all. The damage is uh, extremely extensive. It covers um, much of the cliff line. Uh, so it's going to be a very significant process to um, review what's happened there, to identify which houses are at risk. And I'm going back out there this afternoon to talk to the local residents about the, the next steps. We're um, partway through the placarding process at the moment, uh, and it's going to take a little while to finish that. Once that's finished, there's a much bigger piece of work that's going to follow, looking at which parts of Murawai um, can be successfully restored and what other options we have for the areas where we think the risk is just too high. All right, from that, I'll uh, pass back to Paul. Uh, if you could restart the slides, please. Good everybody, Paul, Paul Klonek, Tokungwa. Um, I'm the General Manager of the Resilient Land and Coast Department. I, I want to give um, elected representatives a, a bit of an appreciation in respect of some of the coastal damage that's also been sustained as part of this wider storm event. Um, the storm damage can be attributed to both events, so the flooding event, which had an impact upon our coast, anywhere where we had a natural watercourse discharge, and obviously through Cyclone Gabrielle, um, more impacts related to storm surge, um, and coastal erosion. So a quick bit of context for Cyclone Gabrielle from a coastal perspective. Um, swell of around 10 metres recorded offshore of Marsden, of some wave boys that they have up there. Um, we were fortunate in some respects that we had a reasonably low tide, so it was a three metre tide, um, but because of the low pressure system and storm surge components, um, a realised water level of around 4.2 metres. So just to give a bit of context, uh, from a king tide perspective, and, and you'll all be aware of when we have king tides, they're usually around 3.6 metres. It's those tides which inundate and can flood some of our roading, some of our infrastructure, some of our Esplanade Reserve. So this was quite uh, unique in respect of the water levels, uh, the swell that was actually realised at the coast. And obviously, um, when you look at some of the imagery, I want to share um, some of the resulting impacts. So. I want to focus a little bit on Oriwa, and I'm going to I'm going to move back to Murray's Bay. But again, these are only indicative of the sort of damage that we're observing, um, that we're, we're tracking currently. And the team at the moment is moving around the southeast coast of Auckland, um, and over the next uh, week or two, we'll move to the offshore islands as well, expecting that we might find 
um, some damage in and around Waiheke and obviously Aotea, a great barrier. So uh, the image you can see here, a good example of, of a small watercourse um, at Kinloch Reserve turning into quite a large watercourse during the flooding event and then being impacted uh, by some of that coastal energy wave attack. Um, it's removed the footbridge, scaled out um, an area of reserve there, so quite a, quite a decent loss of public land in that space, and obviously access has been compromised. Um, you can see some of the infrastructure has been damaged there as well. That's a water line discharging to the right of the image. Um, if we move a little further north in Oriwa, um, between Marine View and Kohu Street, um, some of the elected members will be aware this is we were proposing to build um, a seawall in this location. Um, what you can see there is loss of material that used to exist over some of the debris that you can see in place. That used to be Esplanade Reserve, and what we've lost uh, to date is land or Esplanade Reserve, public open space, back to the private property boundary. Um, obviously issues um, in respect of erosion that exposes debris, um, bits of concrete and rebar. So there's a, there's a plan of action at the moment when debris like that's exposed to work with our parks community facilities and their contractors to remove some of that debris. If we move a little south, um, this is an image that's getting quite a bit of uh, media coverage at the moment. This is Oriva Reserve. Again, a, a pretty stark example of uh, the effects of coastal erosion in and around that part of the reserve. Um, we have a line of Norfolk pines that were planted there um, historically um, along the dune crest. Um, and what we're finding is it's becoming increasingly difficult uh, to manage the coastal fringe in this location with the trees being set so far forward. Uh, there is a plan uh, to manage that part of the beach with uh, sand replenishment, regular sand replenishment. Um, and today there is sand being transferred to that location. You cannot see those roots anymore. So sand's been um, reinstated, pushed back in there. Uh, our arborists, who you can see in the distance here in that photo, are quite confident that the root, uh, the trees remain stable in their current position and the sand buffer will uh, remain a good management response for the foreseeable future. Um, Murray's Bay, just my last image, um, uh, indicative of the sort of um, seawalls that we're finding have been overtopped um, with inadequate drainage, um, scoured at the base or the foundation, rotating forward and failing. Um, there is quite a lot of work to be done in this space, renewal, repair, rebuild. Um, but importantly, in instances like this, our focus remains not just on the uh, make safe and exclude people from a safety perspective, but making sure that we understand what critical infrastructure um, resides in this area as well. So what you can't quite see in this image is a wastewater line that runs in behind the bank that's been scoured. So it's likely that in instances like this along our coast, there might be a two-stage approach of some uh, urgent emergency works or buffering of the coast, and that might be via provision of geotextile and rock uh, before we come back in and rebuild, um, likely to be a structure in a location like that under our renewals work program. With that, I'll pass back to Ross. Thank you, Paul. So uh, this slide is uh, used to explain some of the things that we're doing to understand the extent of the damage. Um, one of the key things that we're trying to do is ensure that we uh, have a very detailed understanding of what's going on across the region, because it is very hard sometimes to get the big picture for these. So we have uh, a project underway at the moment to um, scan our entire coastline using LIDAR. I'll put a little bit of an explanation up there. Um, it's effectively a, a laser scanning technique which creates a very accurate 3D model uh, and we're using that um, to give us a baseline to understand the erosion rates so that we can inform future planning decisions about where things should be built and where they shouldn't be built based on really robust science. Fortunately, with this particular project, we collected the full data set uh, and finished about two days before the storm hit. Uh, and we're now using the same provider to uh, repeat some of the areas so that we can get a good understanding of what the change has been directly as a result of that storm and use that to inform our decision making in the future. Uh, we're also collecting uh, satellite imagery um, from after the events and getting access to interim satellite, satellite imagery from between the events so we get a really good understanding of where the landslides are across the region and we're working closely with GNS Science and with the, uh, the New Zealand Landslides Database to make sure that we have really robust data sets that can inform uh, our risk assessments and our planning decisions, as well as where we put our assets and what's at risk. And, and perhaps not least, probably most importantly, we have a, a large team of staff out on site uh, going around assessing these sites, supporting people who've been affected, and trying to understand exactly what needs to be done to do remedial works or to support those other people who 
uh, doing remedial works privately. There's going to be a lot of long-term thinking that needs to come out of this. We are very much in the emergency response stage and dealing with the tragic circumstances that have hit people across the region, and I'm thinking particularly in Mirawai, where my team is today. The things that we need to start thinking about in the long term, though, um, renewal of damage structures. Uh, there has been a lot of damage, uh, and we need to think carefully about how we renew those in a way that makes them resilient and robust, and whether renewal is the right decision in each case. So we need to be sure, careful that we don't um, jump in with a quick response without thinking it through carefully. Um, I've talked a little bit about data. Um, this is a fantastic learning opportunity for us, and that might be the, the one silver line that we see to this. There is a lot of information that we can get from this, and it's very important that we don't miss the opportunity to learn the lessons from this and to build that into our thinking in the future. And there will be plenty of unknowns. So there's a lot for us to think about uh, and a lot of work that still needs to go. We are very much in the early stages of this. Uh, so you'll expect plenty more updates from us as we go through this process. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ross and Paul. And, and as you said, un unfortunately, a number of those images are pretty typical uh, of large parts of, of Auckland. Uh, you know, they, they are typical examples now. Um, We've got some waste slides with Paul. Uh, okay, do, do we yeah, want to show them now? Yeah. After Paul and after the finish. Yeah, okay, great. So, so yeah, so these, um, the visual imaging here is, is really quite striking. So um, I'll open up for questions to, to Ross and Paul. Yes, uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, uh, obviously, I've got a, a high degree of familiarity with uh, the Hibiscus Coast in various areas. And in a number of circumstances, you've got stormwater from the roading network that's going over coastal cliffs onto the cliff area and loading it up. So I'm just bringing to your attention that there are aspects of stormwater that have got issues. And as we covered off earlier, part of the issue around that is you've got walking transport that is involved with one part. You've got healthy waters that's involved with another part. And then you've got coastal processes and, and, and so on. And how are we going to deal with that interface so that the, the problem is dealt with in its totality? Because people in the community see it, and quite often they've raised these issues and they find that it just gets pushed from one part to another. Thank you. Go to Councillor Walker through through the chair. Um, I won't go into too much detail today, but but I would make reference to some of the work that's currently underway from a from a coastal management perspective, in respect of the shoreline adaptation plans that Council's preparing. Um, it's timely that we're bringing another plan back to um, committee in March for approval, and I've asked the team to speak a little bit more to not only the plan for approval, but reference to um, some of the short-term uh, impacts of storm events, how that factors into some of our longer-term considerations for climate change, and importantly, um, how we better leverage really good relationships and collaboration across the council family that the SAPs help um, pull together. So uh, within that piece of work, for example, we have Auckland Transport, um, Water Care, um, the CTOs, various departments of council are all interwoven in our approach and our reference to um, short, medium, longer term management uh, options that we can we can look to adopt. So we will spend a little bit more time going into that detail based on your question when we come back in March. I'd also like to um, make reference to some of the work um, that we do within my department as well, um, guidance documents, technical standards. So we are undertaking a review at the moment around um, what we have, what we might need and what might need to be changed. Again, that's another vehicle to bring the council family um, together, and, and, and the council family is collaborating currently in that space. But I think recent events are really helping us focus on the, the need to adjust, refocus, pivot in this space. So um, quite a bit of work afoot. And again, you'll hear me and the team and Ross speak a little bit more when we come back to committee in March. Uh, just one other related example, and again, it just goes to that uh, general coastline. 
we've got a circumstance in many instances throughout the Hibiscus Coast where all the outfalls are below mean high water springs. The consequence when we had an onshore event is that a number of those outfalls, Manly, for example, was totally blocked. Um, again, it goes to the interaction between um, healthy waters, coastal and the like. I mean, I was in a position where I was on the ground and noticed that. So I was able to get hold of an engineer or get some information to an engineer so that it was dealt with. Because in this instance, in a number of coastal areas, we actually dodged a bullet. If there had have been a worse event in terms of rainfall and, as you pointed out, higher tides, and normally that's the case, in a number of situations there would have been inundation of areas. So my question just goes to the preparedness around the interconnection so that you've got people on the ground that are aware of where these hotspots are which can be identified so that they're being attended to. Any response around that, Paul? Through the Chair. Um, in addition to, well, it, it, I think my response previously has captured a little bit of how we're thinking about addressing interconnectivity of disciplines for the SAPs. Um, there's probably a little bit more work happening in that space um, than some of the elected members might be aware of. So again, we will bring back a comprehensive update as to how we're meshing uh, the various considerations that need to be um, worked through. Um, these are the things that speak to some of the recommendations we make around whether we hold the line, whether we look to retreat and naturalise over time, um, or whether we are reliant upon infrastructure or, or more uh, towards a, a naturalised approach where working in with nature. Um, again, the issues that are raised, and, and they, are, they are very important issues, they are well known. I think it's the challenge of, of how we we work together to map the best way forward. Um, you, you heard Ross speak to um, the fact that this event is enabling us to capture a lot of data, um, a lot of observation, and I think um, there's an opportunity here while it's fresh in the community's minds, having experienced back-to-back -back quite extreme uh, storm events to, to help lead a conversation around community's expectations as well. Um, what we can do within our, um, our, our portfolios currently to make better some of what's been discussed, but importantly, mapping out what the future needs to look like um, to get us there. So it, it is a great question. It is something that we're, we are considering. It is something the council family is collaborating on. Um, I think it's just the task for us is to bring that back um, to have a bit more of a focused discussion in that space. And importantly, to map out scenarios or scenario testing as to what some of those options actually look like on the ground. Thank you, Paul, and it's certainly something we're going to have to be spending a lot more time with in this committee. Mia Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ross and I had the benefit of walking along Afitu, staring at cliffs and some rather hopeful coastal um, protection works. Uh, and we agreed from a geological point of view what we were sta staring at, and I really tell Toka what both of you are doing. This is an opportunity for a broad education of public in a, not simplistic, but in a simplified, understandable way about some messages. We, a lot of coastal stuff has been self-funded, and, and that falls into the hopeful uh, bracket, like the block all that fell over in one of your pictures. And there are some things we learn that do work and some don't. And, and nothing is a guarantee if you're going to be on the coast. But um, penetrable structures like stone gabions work a lot better than block walls do. Hard fixed things don't, just don't work. So we can, if we are going to, people will want us to do some of their own work. At least we can guide them away from dumb stuff that actually looks good but doesn't work. Um, the ground movement is no respecter of boundaries, um, and uh, we need to remind people with some simple messages that cliffs grow backwards. You will never have more land if you're on a cliff. Your view will improve until you're part of it. Um, so some simple do's and don'ts 
and and along with what we had before, uh, something that sea cleaners that I'm involved in do is stop putting rubbish into our system. Um, that's from the two guys before you, but in your ones, I, it sounds to me like you're heading towards some simple rules. We will have some. It's it's going to be hard to determine where we do and don't get on top of a cliff. The further you go back, the safer you get. Um, but exactly is there a point at which you become safe? No, it's not really. Um, and fraught with this difficulties, we will be finding us under a lot of legal challenge. The, the wealthy people on the cliffs will lawyer up to try and blame us for giving them building consents. We need to be aware of that as an issue too. So I very much thank you for your stuff. It's going to, there's more to come out of this and more steps to come from what you're doing. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought we'd take that by, by way of a comment and feedback. So thanks very much, Ross and Paul, um, for that update and look forward to seeing a bit more of you as the year progresses. Before we go to the Auckland Transport uh, representatives, we've got a, a quick update from Peru uh, with respect of the, the waste uh, response and, and consequences of the, the storm and the cyclone. Welcome, Peru. I better switch that on. Thank you so much for having us here because waste sometimes gets forgotten in the infrastructure conversation. But I think waste is a big part of what happens when an event like this strikes a city. And I just wanted to reflect on how we have responded to what has come our way, but also to just reflect on what does the waste infrastructure deal with. So we focused on mainly the residential elements of what we faced as a part of this event. But the waste infrastructure actually dealt with the flooded retail shops, the supermarkets that all got flooded, all the material that came from those flooded uh, shops and supermarkets had to go somewhere. So the infrastructure then, when we talk about waste and what, what is the infrastructure that sits behind it is it starts on your curbside with your trucks, which picks it up. It then takes it to a facility, which are normally transfer stations. From there, it bulk hauls to a landfill. At those facilities, it also tends to try and recover what we can from it. We have been able to collect materials such as whiteware and being very mindful of what you might have in your fridge and having to degas those elements at those transfer stations. So health and safety is of primary concern for us when we deal with waste. So I just want to take you through a few slides, which just give you a bit of a flavor in terms of what the team has been doing over the last three weeks, pretty much. Um, so we set up initially a self-help in terms of going from 1 to 15 transfer stations region-wide to actually have uh, residents take their material to for free. Now, just bearing that in mind that these facilities are not owned and operated by council. We have the Waitakere facility that we own and operate. We have community recycling centers that form part of this network, which we are really grateful to have. Others are owned and operated by the private sector. And they, we were grateful for them to come on board with us to actually establish those facilities for residents to take their material for free. We also have the call center called the number that we set up to actually uh, for people to call and request and request a service. And this was related to whether we could help them get the material out of the homes or what it is for to pick up from the curbside. So that was put in play. It was a joint effort, as I said, with the private waste companies. Initially, we went with the ones we knew and the ones that we've been working with. But the size of the problem was so large that we had to innovate and look at who else can we bring, bring into the fold. We had three deconstruction companies that brought in their fleet. And I'll show you some photographs of some trucks which I have never dealt with before. They're massive and they have grab arms on them. But that is what was needed to actually clear up the city. While we were trying to deal with the flood waste, the cyclone was coming. And I guess the mandate there was try and get it off the street as soon as possible. So the team has, uh, my entire team was deployed to do this work while we continued our curbside collections. We could not forget that the bins still needed to be collected off the curbside. And that is a service we provide weekly and fortnightly in the entire region. We definitely needed extra person power to do this because you can have a truck but you cannot have the driver going all the time, and you cannot have the people collecting off the curb going all the time. We were limited and are still limited by driver hours, but also fatigue. 
for people who are picking up heavy material off the curb and putting it in the truck. So I guess just in numbers, um, reflecting on what we were dealing with, over 3,000 requests for service. Uh, in terms of context, waste does get a lot of requests for service. I think we deal to about 120,000 a year, but this was on top of it. So we had to deal with uh, a large number of requests for service coming through. We managed to put out approximately 850 bins, skip bins and flexi bags out there. We started a bit slow, but then they ramped up pretty quick. In some situations, we actually gave the bin out and then we had to empty it about three, four times. So they saw a lot of bins that were used. We could not get to each and every um, part of the city quick enough, but that was because of what resources we had and what people we could put in the mix. As I said, we pulled in more contractors. So by the end of it, we had 10 contractors out there in the city picking from the curb. This was made up of our own waste companies, but also the deconstruction companies, as I said, but also the community organizations that are part of the, the network. Any truck, anybody who could drive it, and of course, yes, health and safety was the main concern, made sure that was all done, and we pulled them in to actually clear a lot of streets. Some streets, I know, we've gone over and over again. I think one number was eight times. So as we picked up the material, more came out, uh, but the teams have been going at it since then. We've seen a number of customers come through our facilities as well. These are customers or loads, uh, but I think one weekend, the Wi-Fi transportation actually saw one, a customer a minute. So that's a really fast flowing event in terms of that facility. And the idea was to take the material off and get the customer back on the road as soon as possible. We did see a little bit of frustration in the community because there were long queues at these facilities as people were trying to get rid of their material. So this is just a graphic to give you an idea of where the request for service came from. The bits in red obviously give you an idea that was the, those were the hotspots. And I'm sure you all are very aware of what's happened in your communities. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for giving us the intel that sat within your communities as well. It helped the team to prioritize as well. We had people monitoring the areas, but sometimes we just can't be everywhere. So a big thank you to the elected members for giving us the intel. This is just a photograph of the different type of trucks that we've actually utilized. So you can see a massive truck on the top, uh, which is from a deconstruction company. And there are others that have got the grab arms on them. We found very quickly that some material we can get people to pick and load. The other bits are easier done by a grab arm. To, mo to mobilize this fleet, we needed to get the health and safety aspects of them done really quickly to ensure there were no accidents on the road and we were doing a really safe operation. These are still out in, uh, in the field at the moment, uh, trying to get rid of the bits that are left now. So I talked about calling for additional uh, person power, very, very important, and a big thank you to the, the Defense Force for actually having their personnel with us doing this, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't have got through the piles that we had. One of the photographs that shows you an aerial view, which we took from the helicopter together with the Defense Force, where you could see our trucks actually collecting the piles as they were doing it. This just gives you a pictorial view of the trust stations or the facilities that we have got that are providing that service for free now for people affected by the cyclone as well. And it is a bit of a, it is a good spread in terms of the region. Uh, which is there to cater for communities that, so that people can reach these uh, facilities quick enough. And in this graph, we can also see that Boitakri actually received quite a big chunk of the material uh, that we are working with at the moment. So I guess having that facility as part of our infrastructure is quite good because we were able to mobilize it quite quickly and also able to respond to any issues that come through, like being able to um, degas bridges and the white way that we've been collecting. Just my last slide, reflecting on the piles. Uh, it's always good to have a picture of rubbish in the background. That's the um, tipping floor of Waitakere, and you can see it has been quite high over the last few days. But we've also had the uh, Defence Force officials helping us through that facility. And I just also want to uh, talk a little bit about the community recycling centres and the role that they have played in the network, 
Uh, some of them have taken material as it has come. They are taking material from the curbside, missed curbside collection days as well. But they're also hubs for the community where donated goods are coming into. And they are able to give that back into their communities. So while they have a role to play in waste, they actually have a role to play in resource recovery as well. So as a network, I feel we have done quite well in terms of what's come at us. We were fortunate that none of the facilities were actually massively damaged by the floods and the landfills were all open and accessible. We've had to extend times at those facilities, but otherwise the infrastructure has managed to cope well. We been getting to some areas, other areas having some incredibly speedy responses. So um, overall, I think it was, it was an impressive uh, effort. Councillor Darby, question online. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, just so, uh, just back to Ross. Uh, Ross, um, with the cliff failures, coastal cliffs and others, of course, um, there's a lot of debris in the coastal marine area, like um, a lot of trees, soil, rock, um, and um, people are wondering, well, what what do they do? Um, what are the communications that are going out to those that are affected? Uh, there are instances of people going out and um, I've seen it, um, chainsawing away at Putakawa at the tops of cliffs that actually may not be the smartest thing to do. Um, you know, what when, when debris is in the coastal marine area, whose is it and how should people be responding? But more importantly, what is the message package that is going out and how is that going out? through the chat. Um, thank you for that question. This is a fairly complex and controversial topic, um, and it's something that we haven't um, sent out specific communications on to date. Uh, we've been focused very much on the emergency response and the uh, recommendations to people about keeping themselves safe um, from landslides, from floods. Uh, and we didn't want to um, cause communication overload uh, and water down those safety messages with other messages at the same time. However, I think it is now the time to get onto those, and I agree that we can um, focus on that in, in the coming days. It is a complex area when it comes to responsibility, and there is a mixture of private and public land that's affected. If it is all on private land, um, legally it is a private issue, uh, and that becomes very challenging for people to deal with, because it's not something that homeowners would normally have to do. Uh, and we certainly don't recommend that people get out with a chainsaw and start chopping up trees on uh, steep slopes. Uh, and likewise, we don't recommend that they do it in the um, coastal marine area either. So if it's on the foreshore, it's generally much better to leave it be um, rather than try and chop it up. Uh, we don't want to create a shipping hazard. And the harbour master has an important role to play in making sure that the um, most dangerous pieces are dealt with. So it's good to report those through to the council hotline and see if the harbour master can support in those cases. Where we're looking at uh, rockfall or soil that's fallen onto the foreshore, in general, the um, only appropriate response is to let natural processes take their course. Um, there are not very many um, sensible and safe approaches to going in and taking that sort of material out. And I think the first slide that I showed was probably a good example of that, where there was a rockfall um, at narrow neck and the um, best response there is not to try and dig it out because it's a, it's a challenging place to work in the coastal marine zone. You've got the, the tidal influence that means you've got very short working windows and you've got environmental impacts of having plant there, as well as the danger of working underneath a potentially unstable cliff. So the best bet is to, to let nature dig its course. Cliffs do erode and the material that the tow does over time erode as well. Thanks, Ross. Right, uh, Thanks, Ross. Thank you very much, Ross. OK, just a couple of questions, uh, Councillor Fully and Councillor Hills. Tola, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I just really wanted to commend you, Parol, and your entire team, um, you know, Rob, uh, Rob and um, uh, all the others, Richard and everybody, for your efforts um, during the floods and the effect that that had on our community in Mangere. You know, your response was always really prompt, and I know that your team was working extremely hard to help our communities out in Mangere and in South Auckland to clear their rubbish away. So I really want to commend you and your team for that effort. Um, my question is about going forward. Are we still 
is the message still to our families that they can put rubbish onto the curbside? And then do you still want me to be feeding that information through to you and the team to let you know which are the hot zones? Through you, Mr Chair, yes, that is appropriate at the moment. In terms of flood damage material, Please continue to put it on the curbside. We do have trucks collecting. And uh, let us know that it is on the curbside, and we will ensure that that material is correct, collected. Kilda, thank you. And can people still call to request a skip? Because I get that question all the time as well. Uh, yes, for any flood damage material, yes, you can request a skip. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Final question, uh, Councillor Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair Watson. Um, yeah, just want to also acknowledge you, Parul. I think I can claim the, the first containers in Auckland went to um, Sunny Nook after I know the initial response was to wait for insurers, but that was clearly going to be a pretty dangerous situation with the piles and piles of uh, rubbish. And just want to acknowledge that the, the teams, the contractors in those trucks, especially down Nile Road, which I think was seven or eight days of complete removal, those workers were in essentially sewage soaked rubbish for days and days. It was horrendous. Um, but they had smiles on their faces and they were trying their best to make people feel um, OK when they're seeing everything they've ever owned being removed, which was pretty heartbreaking in those situations. So they just part, if you could pass that on. Uh, I guess my question just around um, the cost of this, and is there any way, and it probably isn't, um, to go back to the some of the insurers and others, because I know that insurers over the last week or so have been telling people, don't worry, council, just call council, um, because they're covering it. And I know that's what we didn't want to do, but we're sort of getting to the place where insurers should be able to manage this process now on smaller, on a smaller scale. When it was big streets with big piles, I get it, but is there sort of some pushback or message going to the um, insurers that actually they should be covering it now. Um. Through you, Mr Chair, the message has remained similar in terms of insurance should cover. But what we have found in certain situations that people are insured, they're not insured enough. Okay. So I think the message for us has always been we are here to help people who cannot um, cover it by themselves. Uh, and in terms of uh, areas where we have found that the house belongs to Housing New Zealand or others, and we found insurance companies saying, can you cover this? We've actually pushed back. And we've said, actually, this is your responsibility. If it comes to a health uh, issue or a safety issue, we would get in there and do it uh, and not argue over who pays for it at that point in time. But we've definitely pushed in terms of where the cost lies. Cool. Just thank you so much for your responsiveness and being so flexible with changing the rules almost hourly at some points in that first week. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Parul and Ross, for coming up again. Our final two presenters on, on the, the flood response uh, come from Auckland Transport. I think it would probably be appropriate to uh, thank you for your, your patience, folks. So we've got uh, Murray Burt and Andrew Allen and perhaps a, a couple of other people. And uh, then we'll... We'll, we'll finish off this item to do with the, the infrastructure impacts, OK? Uh, Mark, would you like to, to introduce the presenters? Thank you, um, Chair, and Tanakota Kata, and good afternoon, councillors. Um, I'll un hand over in a minute to Andrew Allen, who's our um, EGM for service delivery, and who's spearheaded our response um, to these events. And also Murray Burtz here, our chief engineer, who's leading our recovery phase, um, which we commenced um, a few days ago. Firstly, um, I would like to thank um, the council and um, councillors and all the agencies that we've been working with over the last however long, two or three weeks. Um, it seems quite an intense period, obviously. Um, but thank you to emergency services, the council departments, water care um, and Waka Kotahi, who we've been um, working extremely closely with. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Aucklanders um, for listening to the communications we've been putting out, um, particularly around um, keeping off the roads to um, only driving uh, where necessary. It has helped us and it's helped, I know, certainly our other partner agencies. 
Um, before I hand over to Andrew, I'd just like to do a quick summary. Um, and most of this is based on the initial response rather than the cyclone, um, but certainly I'll be able to provide a few more um, numbers around that as well. So AT has been plugged into the Auckland Emergency Management um, uh, arrangements and responses um, for Auckland. Um, we are based and we work out of what's called ATOC, um, the Auckland Transport Operations Centre, which for those who don't know, um, is based in Smells Farm. Um, and it's a joint venture initiative with uh, Waka Kotahi. So out of that um, control room, Waka Kotahi is managing the upper North Island. Um, and obviously Auckland Transport is managing um, the local transport network um, in Auckland. Uh, we operate 24-7 and we permanently um, have rosters in place and um, during the hours of 5 a.m. and 10 p.m. and pretty much every day for the last three uh, weeks, uh, we've been operating our enhanced incident management team. Um, just a couple of numbers. Um, on the Saturday, 28th of January, following the original event, um, there was around just over 100 roads were closed. Um, and as of two weeks ago, uh, sorry, two weeks later, there was 11 um, roads closed. And Murray's team is now working through, or was working through, how long those um, roads would take to um, fully repair and clear. Um, at the moment, uh, we have um, 62 roads fully closed um, and another 47 which um, have partial closures. We replaced one bridge um, within six days with the significant help from Wahoo and um, one abutment repair. Across the rail network, there was 20 slips um, and five major slips. And I know Andrew will talk about parking enforcement and um, towing um, abandoned cars and, and cars caught in the floodwaters. Um, I think we've towed um, in the last three weeks um, or, uh, around 2,600 cars, um, which is just incredible. Um, as I say, we have commenced our recovery phase at the moment, which our Chief Engineer Mary Bird is leading. Um, um, but on, on that note, I'll hand over to Andrew to go through some more of the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Tenakoto Katoa. Um, Mark's probably stolen most of my thunder around the Auckland Transport Operations Centre. I wasn't going to spend a lot of time here, so I probably will move on to the next slide. All I wanted to really cover off, in addition to what Mark said, is that that Auckland Transport Operations Centre monitors, as he said, the network, both ours and Waka Katahi's roading network, and our public transport services in real time, 24-7, 365. Um, and they respond to, on the right-hand side of that slide, uh, you can see some of the sorts of um, areas that they are across monitoring, and their focus is really to detect issues and then deploy our contractors or our resources to address and restore the network to its normal operating conditions. So the next slide is just also by way of a bit of a context. We have focused quite heavily on trying to get out to the best of our abilities communication um, so that people had a pretty clear understanding from the 27th through to current day um, what was happening across the transport network, both from a roading perspective and from a public transport perspective. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, just probably a, a few key takeouts. We have been doing two to three media releases a day um, and trying to focus in on current issues and disruptions and delays, roads that are closed. Those media releases, as I say, going out two to three times a day. Um, we've had a website running from the very first day of the event, and that website we've been endeavouring to keep up to date in real time. Um, acknowledging that sometimes things are happening and unfolding quicker than we can update a website. Um, but that website has been in place and remains in place. Um, and we've also dedicated resources to um, ensuring that the work that all of you, our elected members, do in terms of representing your communities uh, do get answers to your questions and your queries as you're firing through and getting them through to us. So we've had resources in place and hopefully your experience has been one where you've been able to get access to good quality information to date. I might hand over now to Murray, who's going to take us through some of the impacts. And, and as Mark's touched on, I will do that too for some of the areas. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. And kia ora, everyone. Um, as Mark said, I'm Murray, the Chief Engineer at Auckland Transport. And I've had some first-hand experience of the flood when the water started coming through uh, my garage door and then filled up the ground floor of my house. Uh, and also my previous job working with the United Nations, I've been involved in response and recovery on a major 
floods in Bangladesh and, and earthquakes in Haiti and other places. So trying to apply some of that skills and knowledge here in Auckland. The impact on the Auckland roads has, has been quite large, really massive impact. Uh, in, in the flood event, um, we had over 300 uh, slips come down onto the road in different places. And we did some rapid work uh, in the days after that. And pretty soon in the, in the following days, we had uh, more than 85 of the roads reopened. And uh, like Mark said, we were down to only 11 closures before the next event, the cyclone hit, where we had uh, straight away another 150 roads closed. And we're already doing a lot of work towards reopening many of those. And it's changing every day. Um, but the latest reports that I've had is that we now have access open to all communities and that the final community that we're, we're just cutting through some tree trunks now to open up at least single lane access is down in Karakari. So we've got uh, single lane access into Piha for residents and emergency vehicles. Um, Murawai, we've opened up those roads also for residents. And, and Scenic Drive is the other area where we have some large slips, at least five slips on Scenic Drive, but we're managing to get access for, for all uh, residents in that area. Helping us in this effort, obviously, is, is our contractors, and we've got over 550 workers out there on the network um, cleaning up uh, slips and, and, and working on opening up the road. And obviously, other areas of concern is uh, the Afitu Peninsula, a major slip there, and uh, Great Barrier Island, where we've also got um, debris on the road. Just to see the scale of some of these uh, sites that we're working with, um, some of these uh, underslips and overslips are enormous, and it will take us some time to get engineering assessments and uh, work out ways that we can rebuild uh, these roads, and in some cases, at least one, there's a possibility we might have to look at a road realignment uh, up in, in the Rodney district uh, to be able to reopen access just because of the size of the slips that we're dealing with. We've also had impacts on our bridges. Uh, one bridge completely washed away in Millflat Road up uh, near the Coatesville area, and another bridge, uh, Sherwood Drive, where the abutments were washed out. And I guess the good news is that our contractors that was able to mobilise very quickly and get the Millflat Road bridge, uh, a Bailey Bridge in replacement there within a week. So we're able to open up that road. But obviously the, the long-term rebuild of that bridge will take some time as we work through a design process. And I guess this is one of these areas where we're looking at um, what, to what level of standard do we rebuild back and thinking about resilience, thinking about uh, climate change, and obviously that bridge was not built to withstand a flood of this level and uh, thinking about redesigning to, to meet 100 year flood standards or should it be something higher? So those are broader design questions. On the stormwater network, um, I know that Craig McElroy's touched on this. Healthy Waters obviously takes a lead role in uh, maintaining the stormwater work network, including the catch pits on the roads. Um, but maybe just a couple of things to highlight here that often these uh, road stormwater networks under traditional New Zealand design standards are designed for relatively small storms. So one in 10 or one in 20 year storms. Um, and then after that, there's an expectation that there'll be flow uh, across the road in a hundred year flow path. So that also is possibly another area that we need to relook at in terms of adaptation and what are the design standards that we build to. But a good example um, that you can see here in these pictures, we worked uh, very closely with Healthy Waters where we identified a culvert uh, on Wilverton Road in a previous flood event uh, that was declared to be uh, not robust and not right sized and also had cracks in the culvert. So we pushed through under Emergency Works a major replacement program uh, jointly with Healthy and um, you can see on the bottom right that that culvert held up very well. The road stayed dry, the water was flowing through it. Uh, and I guess that just shows the difference between new infrastructure down the bottom and old infrastructure around Green Lane where we saw surcharging coming onto the road. Um, in the area of public transport, 
obviously disruptions on the network, whether it's uh, slips on the rail line or uh, flooding or slips onto the road mean that uh, the public transport uh, operations are disrupted and detours have to be put in place. Often these detours are real time. And I have a friend who's a bus driver telling me how she was out on the network driving her bus, getting radio calls in from the bus operator saying, there's a slip up ahead of you, you need to detour and, and take a different route. So that um, type of information is going out through the, the ATOC, the Auckland Transport Operations Centre, in conjunction with the public transport operators to be able to manage those real-time uh, detours and diversions. In terms of the ferry network, all the debris floating in the harbour, uh, tree trunks and so on that Ross was talking about, cause other hazards for ferries, and we've had at least two ferries that have hit uh, floating debris and brake propellers. And this only goes towards uh, disruptions in the ferry network that uh, we already had issues around uh, shortages of crews on the ferry network, and then now with some vessels uh, hitting logs and having maintenance problems, that also brings uncertainty. We've done a lot to communicate with our customers through this process and keep them updated through uh, our, our website, our mobile apps, and, and social media. Back to Andrew to talk about abandoned vehicles and parking. Um, yeah, this slide won't take very long. The number uh, that Mark referred to has actually changed quite dramatically from when these slides were prepared. So we're sitting at uh, in excess of 6,000 vehicles that have been towed that were either flood damaged or are insurance claims or have been removed. Uh, for safety reasons from the network and from flood struck areas. I think the only other point I'd just note here is in terms of all of our car parks, the only one that sustained flooding and damage has been the Civic car park and has required us to close that car park, lease levels two and three on occasion. Um, that's by and large now been restored and cleared. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and a number of people have touched on the efforts of the Harbour Master to date. Um, that image just demonstrates um, or shows some of the sorts of um, debris that we've had to pull out of the harbour in the last few weeks. Um, there have been about, about four barge loads of material removed. That's 50 to 60 tonne of material removed from the harbour um, in order to enable things like um, ferries and, and other shipping to resume safely. Um, the other thing I would just comment on the number of full recreational boats that have sunk. Those numbers have changed since the slide was prepared and Gabriella has come through. So there are now six recreational boats that we are aware of that have sunk and in the process of trying to contact owners and salvage those. And there are a further eight um, recreational boats that have broken free from their moorings and have been grounded. I think the other point that, is, that has occurred since these slides were prepared uh, and in preparedness and readiness for Gabrielle arriving is that the Harbour Master, in conjunction with Ports of Auckland, has required that all large ships head out to sea before Gabrielle made landfall. Uh, and all of those providers headed out to sea, all of those ships went out to sea, some of them anchored out in the Rocky Gulf and others went out to sea. Um, there was one exception to that, and that was the Arcadia, the cruise ship that remained alongside for safety reasons um, throughout the process or throughout the duration of uh, Gabrielle making landfall. Um, and I'll hand back to Murray just to cover off a little on recovery. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So the picture you can see there is the Milfat Road Bailey Bridge uh, now open for traffic. Uh, I thought that was a fabulous effort getting that uh, put in so quickly. And I guess that kicked off part of our recovery program, which probably will swing into full force uh, next week as we look to do detailed assessments of all the damage across the network. Uh, document that, start to understand what the costs will be to repair and replace uh, these damaged assets. And particularly, we're looking at um, the bridges, the, the slips on the roads, and also significant damage to road pavements, as well as other asset classes where, like for instance, the Civic Car Park will need some assessment of uh, structural integrity and so on uh, as we move forward. So a, a lot's going on. We're classifying it into first phase recovery where we can do things quickly within the first month, but then there will be those outstanding projects um, that will take much longer and we'll need to communicate very clearly with communities in a two-way communication of what's going on and how long it will take to, to fix things up. 
and then uh, working obviously with our funding partners, Waka Katahi, on how we look to uh, fund, fund the repairs. So thank you very much. Open to questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you need up any backup to that barge that was clearing the harbour, you can maybe use the, your bus that was going through the water at only hung there. Just put it on Trade Me, you'll make a fortune. <laughs> Councillor Stewart. Oh, thank you for that update. Couldn't you just tell me at what time on the 27th of January were you first made aware that we had a serious emergency happening? Through the chair. Um, we were first made aware, I can't tell you the exact time off the top of my head, but it was around 8 o'clock that we were first met in the evening. We already had an IMT stood up, so an incident management team stood up, and the reason for that was on that night, as probably many people will remember, we had a large concert planned at Mount Smart, uh, and so what we typically do for those large concerts is we do stand up a team to manage the flow of people to and from those events, uh, and also organise and manage all of the special event services that are put on for those large events. So that team was already in place from earlier in the afternoon, and obviously um, as we saw this weather event unfolding and the information coming through from Auckland Emergency Management, we pivoted from managing a special event to managing a flood event during the course of the night. So you got no nobody alerted you to a situation, even though it was being played out on, on social media, nobody alerted you? The, the, the information we had was around the sort of um, data that was shared earlier by, I think it was Craig, in terms of a, a storm event coming through, but we were not anticipating, based on the forecast, anything near the scale of what actually arrived. So those forecasts were around 20 millimetres of rain coming through. That was what we were aware of, and when we stood up our IMT, what we were kind of anticipating, but that is not what unfolded. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. And just a quick question on that myself. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned that the team that was working uh, on the, the event team in preparation for the concert, um, there, there was a lot of uh, talk and focus on the uh, adequacy of the service that was getting put on to that concert that last night, I, I, I regarded with a bit of academic interest myself because I know that in terms of the Eden Park concert with Billy Joel just a short while ago, the same questions were raised and, you know, uh, AT pulled that off without uh, too much trouble at all. Um, what was, was that attention a, a, a distraction uh, in terms of the developments in that day? Because my assumption was that it was well under control, just like how it was under control with Billy Joel and indeed with major events over the last decade that Auckland Transport's been involved with in terms of catering for these events. Um, Chair, it's a great question. Um, the, the key point of difference in terms of how we cater to these large-scale events has been the work that's now happening on the Kiwi Rail Network with the rebuild process and the impact that that then has on the rail network and the services we can provide on the rail network. So um, while we are very used to managing access to and from large events with event organisers, and it's not just an Auckland Transport response, there are a number of entities that come into play here, um, we're used to doing that with train services, and it's probably fair to say that the, the, the biggest load of people moving to and from an event is typically carried by train, both at Mount Smart and Eden Park. Uh, and the issue with Billy Joel, of course, is that we didn't have trains running. It's the first time that we've had a major concert in Auckland at Eden Park with no trains running. That required a huge amount of energy and effort to going into how we take what would typically be circa 18,000 people who get to that event by train and find alternative mechanisms to enable them to get to the concert. We did pull out all stops in terms of um, finding other areas for people to park and walk, park and ride, running shuttles, special event buses, buses direct from the North Shore straight through to the park. There were a raft of initiatives that were put in place to manage the lack of rail for Billy Joel. That is going to be an issue for us. The, the, the impact on the rail network is going to continue to be an issue moving forward for the next few years as we focus on this, or Kiwi Rail focus on the rebuild of the rail network. Um, the night of Elton John that you refer to, uh, I think it is fair to say that, like for Billy Joel, we had a raft 
of um, transport alternatives or initiatives in place to enable the movement of people to and from that event. The unfortunate element there is that there was some confusion within our organisation and an unfortunate social media posting got made advising people to travel by car. At no point in time was it ever our intention to only have people travel to that event by car, but that got out into the environment and I think everybody got really concerned that there was no other provision or no other alternatives in place for people to get to that event. That is categorically not true. Uh, and as I say, there were special event buses. There were actually trains running on the night of Elton John, but the Penrose station was not operational, so we had to shuttle people from there to the next station. That was an impact in terms of the rail. Um, but we had a raft of initiatives in place to enable people to travel on that night. OK, thank you. Uh, just two final questions, Councillor Lee and Councillor Ferry. Yes, I, I had a bit to... Um, say about the um, uh, Elton John concert and the arrangements on that particular day. But let's put that behind us. Um, um, I, I would say, though, but uh, if it wasn't for the, that flood event, there would have been quite a lot of media fallout over uh, what happened um, that weekend or, or what was planned for that week or not planned. Leaving that aside, I want to get back to the the question of catch pits, the importance of which has been uh, brought home to us um, in the last couple of weeks or so. Um, in, in regard to cleaning catch pits, is it um, the responsibility of Auckland Transport to notify healthy waters, or does Auckland Transport rely on uh, um, healthy waters to notify that there's an interface here and obviously room for um, confusion. So is there a regime um, about who notifies who about when a catch pit needs cleaning out? And we won't go into the details of how regular that is. That's something that um, needs to be talk talked about but whose responsibility is it to notify the cleaning of catch pits? Thank you, uh, Councillor Lee. Th through the chair, I can respond to that. Um, so basically how it works is uh, Auckland Transport has a contract with Healthy Waters to clean catch pits uh, on a routine basis of one cleaning per year for each catch pit. Uh, so that happens through uh, Healthy Waters programs the work and manages that themselves um, for, for that routine cleaning. If we get a call uh, from the public or notification from the public that there's an issue, then Auckland Transport can request uh, Healthy Waters to do a exceptional or special cleaning. And prior to the flood event, uh, a number of hotspots were identified where Auckland Transport requested for Healthy Waters to do uh, additional cleaning prior to the, the cyclone. And my understanding is that that uh, cleaning was, was undertaken. And generally, to describe, there's a close working relationship between Healthy Waters and Auckland Transport, um, but the communication flow for any exceptional cleaning would come normally through the Auckland Transport uh, customer request management system. Um, so thank you very much for that. Clearly, once a year um, is not really sufficient, I would say, but that's something to be discussed. Thank you. Councillor Fury. Thank you. Um, hopefully a reasonably quick question. Um, thinking about the fixes that are happening in the system right now and the plans to potentially build things back, um, what considerations being given to identifying those assets where actually there's an opportunity to come up with a, a, a better route or we need to accept that actually there's some managed retreat at play here? And how will those be identified and then communicated clearly to the community to manage expectations? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question uh, through the chair. I guess I, I can't give a definitive answer because some of these things have... Uh, I guess 
there's wider policy decisions around them and there's, there's a wider conversation within the council group about climate uh, adaptation and so on. But I guess in short answer, the way that Auckland Transport is prioritising its work at the moment is to restore some form of access to all communities in, in Auckland City. And as I said, by the end of today, uh, all communities in, in Auckland, including Kerry Kerry, will have some form of access to their properties um, through, through the roading network. Um, in terms of as we build back, those longer term questions about adaptation, resilience and building back better, part of that is related to what we're funded to do um, and broader decisions at, at that policy level around funding. Um, I think I can say that whatever we build back will be to modern day standards. So standards change and evolve over time. So for instance, the, the bridge standards have changed over time and whatever we build back for Mill Flat Road Bridge will be in accordance with the, the accepted standards of today. Um, and any realignments that we look at would be built in, in accordance with current day standards. Thank you. Councillor okay. Stewart. Yes, uh, just thank you for that. Just on the reporting a problem, um, when people ring and report a problem, it usually it's for the whole council family. And often what I hear is, and I'm sure you may hear it as well, that people report a problem only to be emailed back very shortly after they've reported it that the job has been completed and it's obvious it hasn't and sometimes they can report it four, five, six times, it could even be three, four weeks they're reporting the same problem. So I'm just wondering if there's a fall down somewhere in the system, whether it's the call centre and not getting the report a problem to say Auckland Transport or Healthy Waters or Water Care or whatever. So I think that's something we have to look at. But normally what would happen if somebody reports a problem that comes to Auckland Transport, if you haven't dealt with it, do you just do you have staff that just say, well, look, just say it's been completed? and Because that's what we're hearing is happening. Is, is that, would you, can you answer that? I think the old, Murray can add if, I, if if he thinks I've missed anything up, but absolutely we don't have staff who um, are directed to just say things have been closed out when they haven't. Uh, that would be, yeah, that would be, yeah, highly inappropriate. I, I think the point you make, Councillor, is a valid one, and we have identified some issues in terms of how the flow of information works, uh, and we are working with the Council Call Centre and our own call centre and our teams to look at how we can improve the credibility of that flow of information and the response times. So I guess if something happens and it's something to do with Auckland Transport, it's health and water, some water care or whatever, if there's two or three departments that are all involved in it, that should all go to the three or four departments and then you all agree, tick, 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 it's been completed, it's all sorted. This, that seems to be one of the missing ingredients. Yeah, look, that's a great, great comment, and that's exactly what you would expect the case to be. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, look, I'm going to call on into the, the the questions there. I know there's a few more people to go, but we've got an, another couple of pretty substantive items to come. So, uh, thank you for our Auckland Transport uh, presenters. There, I'll call upon uh, Councillor Stewart and Councillor Williamson to to uh, move that we receive this interim update on the impact of the Auckland floods, which has covered all our presenters uh, today on our infrastructure, and uh, really appreciate the, the, the detail, the insight, and the clear messaging that uh, this is now going to be something that we're going to have to follow with uh, some degree of diligence, and this will hopefully be the committee to do that. So um, it's been moved, it's seconded. Um, all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you.